I am glad these Twitter files came out because I think that Twitter yeah. acted way better than I thought they would have. I agree. Um, I expected to see a You're lot run, more a partisan day, bias in the um, in the in the files that came out. But like, um, if it let's say that it was the case that the FBI reached out to them and they were like, "Listen, we need you to kill this Hunter Biden story. Um, this is no good. Like, we can't have this running." That's really scary. What if that happened? It's actually interesting. Uh, okay, well, they're quoting verbatim, so you can take a look at it. What's up? Congrats on winning uh, Wisconsin. You've got to feel really good about uh, DGG's role with that. Um, yeah, the duders went out. Uh, I think you said you got about 25 of them. I didn't even promote it that heavily on my end because I've been traveling and shit, so. Yeah, no, that was exactly it. Um, I think the entire effort overall, I'm still waiting for the, the total numbers on that. It was about uh, 7,500 houses that everyone hit. But just that weekend, it was it was crazy. Like it was uh, almost 2,000 houses. So nice. y'all should be very proud of helping us win on that. Well, very cool. Well, yep. um, what'd you come to chat about today? What do you want? Uh, well, I want to talk about the uh, Matt Taibbi thing. You know, uh, I feel like I understand this a lot from both sides. Uh, you know, I both worked with Twitter to set these policies. And I know Matt Taibbi uh, more than a little bit. So I feel like it's it's one of these things where the, the truth is really in the middle and everybody's missing it. Okay, well, I'm interested in this conversation because I think the truth is as far from Matt Taibbi as could ever possibly be. Or more, maybe more specifically, if there was a truth, Matt Taibbi has positioned himself in such a way that he will never be able to uncover it. But I, I do agree with that. I, I think... I think people have Matt Taibbi's motives really misread here. I mean, I think he's an honest journalist trying to get to the bottom of this story, but I think he has such heavy biases here that he's not really able to think through that, right? Like, it's almost like he's, he has such an extreme knee-jerk reaction to any kind of, um, you know, government pressure or involvement in, you know, deciding what, uh, to, to basically working with Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. That that seems really fascist to him. And I obviously don't think that's true. Yeah, and I'm empathetic to that, but I think that, um... I think this is one of the important times where you can see clearly like why an editor is so important. Um, yeah. Because when you're in charge of getting all the sources from one billionaire, vetting all those sources, printing the material, and having no oversight in that entire process, like a, a personal bias can literally corrupt and rot from the core any type of investigative work you're doing. Um, I spoke to, fuck, somebody in chat will know. It was the guy that did the COVID Twitter files. Z, Z it start, his name started with a Z, and then another journalist that was peripheral to them, uh, somebody, Layton, and um, he's gonna get mad at me because he gets mad when I talk about him, but, um, the the amount of the lack of like journalism that these guys did like yeah. was insane to me like not reaching out to people for comment not trying to verify anything just the entire premise of like i'm going to write oh leighton woodhouse is one of them i don't remember what the other guy's name was um the idea that i'm going to write an article about the prior owners of an organization that a billionaire just bought who's now bringing me in to write articles about them it's like bro you're doing pr like that's yeah. insane to me yeah I, I, this is a wider problem with Substack, too, right? I mean, I don't know if you read uh, Bad Blood by John Kerry, but if you read that story, his editors kept saying, go more, get me more, get a second source, you've got to corroborate this. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it made when the Elizabeth Holmes allegations come out that much stronger. That's why he's a celebrated journalist. When mm -hmm. you have all these Substacks that take the editor out of the equation, I yeah. think what we're seeing is a lot of good journalists do some of the worst work of their career. It happened to Emily Yaffe, um, you know, who I've been following her at Slate for, my God, almost 20 years. I don't agree with everything she's done, but she's clearly doing the worst work of her life over here with Barry Weiss, and it's a real problem in mm -hmm. my view. Yeah, I think you you start to see um, there, there there's like there's the classic joke with libertarians. I think they even on Family Guy did this one where it's like a community like decides to be completely free and they tear down the government and then slowly they rebuild the government. Like oh well you know we're gonna need an organization to police the people. Oh we need an organization to make sure our food is safe. And it's like oh we've got fucking government again. You know um, it feels like we do a lot of these things where it's like okay journalism let's get rid of the corrupt mainstream bullshit. Get rid of all the copy editor. Get rid of all the editors. Get rid of all the oversight. Let's just do raw journalism. It's like well maybe there's a reason why 
this is a really bad idea. <laughs> like, yeah. maybe some of the checks and balances that existed are important. Maybe things like corroboration is actually more important than we gave it credit for. Um, yeah. Rather than just a billionaire giving you information to shit on the prior owners of his company that he now has a massive financial investment in, in trashing um, and then reporting on everything that he's giving you, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I got to know Matt Taibbi. This is kind of his villain origin story. <laughs> Not villain origin story, but this this clearly was very, very traumatic for him, and this is when we met. So it was right after Gamergate, and um, I think it was like 2015, and I start getting these emails from anonymous people. And mm-hmm. I'm sure you can relate to this. And it's people like, hey, go look at all this bad stuff about Matt Taibbi. Here, here's a link of him saying this about forcing his women co-workers to give him blowjobs under the desk. He's a sexual abuser. Please write, tweet anything you can about this. Mm-hmm. And I start getting deluged with this stuff. And I look at it and I go, you know, this is probably more complicated than I'm giving, like, it seems at first blush. So I look into it. Yeah, I'm like, no, this is quoting a book that's obviously satire. This is not true. Mm -hmm. And I forward it to Matt Taibbi. I'm like, I want to let you know someone's trying to run like a disinformation playbook on you, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of my feminist friends did not check out those sources and did start running this playbook against Matt Taibbi. Mm -hmm. And it clearly damaged him. He did a lot of work in back channel to try to get the truth to come out about this. And I think you can really see a switch in his reporting. You know, this was, um, you know, he was doing uh, reporting on Black Lives Matter. And after this event, you can clearly see in his reporting, he started to see the left as a little bit more of a villain. So I'm not, I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that colors like my read of where he is today if that makes sense yeah i agree and unfortunately it almost it feels like almost everybody on the planet's politics is basically defined by like who hurt them last right right. so like if you had a bad experience getting canceled but it's something i've had to be careful of obviously because i've gotten fucking bad on twitch and i've got a lot of like progressives and shit attacking me like and obviously i fight with a lot of progressives but i've got to be careful that like am i like a republican now because i fucking hate progressives like it's really hard not to fall into that trap and i understand the desire not to or i'm I'm sorry I, i understand how difficult it is not to fall into those traps but um man when you're starting to do like incredibly important journalistic work that's not being co-opted by like conservatives and, and Donald Trump, like I think it's I, th- I think it's important to get this right. It's not enough to just be like, okay, yeah, like I'm very empathetic with you, and I understand why you're lying, basically, <laughs> about some of the most important reporting that's existing right now. But like, yeah, I don't think he's lying. I think I lying think is a strong word, but like, yeah, yeah, when you're yeah. so partisan that it's inhibiting your ability to get the 100%. full story, right? Like 100%. that that first question that, and I even noticed this when because I was looking up tweets because that was a question I asked when he's like, oh, tweets are being censored. I'm like, that could either be really bad or an absolute nothing burger when you're saying censored yeah. tweets. Like, is it like a conservative or like a, a, a somebody's tweeting like, I disapprove of Donald Trump trying to overthrow the United States, or you know, um, or I support Donald Trump and I disapprove of the CDC. If tweets like this are getting censored, that's pretty bad. Um, but then when I find out like it's just more like Hunter Biden dick pics. I'm like, okay, this is fucking ridiculous. Why wouldn't you say that? And I know, and that's another thing too, where I know, actually, and I said this on stream, what I said before I started investigating the tweets was, I said, if these tweets were legitimately political censorship, that would have been included. And the fact that they're not saying what was censored makes me think he knows who the tweets are and they're intentionally omitting them. Because if it was political speech, they would absolutely be screaming it from the rooftops. And then that was right, and I don't know, that really bothers me, but. I think he has a really maximalist version of free speech, which makes sense. Like his early formative um, like work was in Russia. He saw the you know fall of communism. It, it, it clearly has affected his his view of things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I really I I'd be really curious to ask you this because a lot of the work that people are critiquing him about. Um, you know, like uh, Mehdi Hassan goes into, you know, there are 2 million tweets here reported. It was actually, I believe, 6,000. Um, you know, this jour- this academic enterprise was set up to measure, among other things, information warfare against the United States. And, you know, this is something I take very, very seriously. We do have bot forms out there that have determined it's cheaper to, you know, run disinformation campaigns and troll farms and exacerbate divisions here in the United States than it is to run a a tank division, right? I mean, don't you think there's some role for government to play in listening to academics that are 
um, like aware of this stuff and, and, and making policy based on that? Because I do. Uh, I mean, I'm like a, I'm an establishment shill. So of right. course I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. But um, the, the thing that frustrates me, and this I reiterate this with every single conversation, whether it's over trans shit or over communist shit or capitalist shit or over Twitter files, is the sensationalism that goes along with this type of reporting inhibits 100%. us from having really good discussions about what's really important. So like, I think that there should be some collaboration between the government and social media when it comes to this type of information. But that is, yeah. that's a very careful, that's a very hairy area to get into, right? Right. Like, um, if it was the case, and I'm actually I'm really glad, and I I am glad these Twitter files came out because I think that Twitter yeah. acted way better than I thought they would have. I agree. Um, I expected to see a Here's lot a more run, a partisan day, bias in the um, in the in the files that came out. But like, um, if it let's say that it was the case that the FBI reached out to them and they were like, "Listen, we need you to kill this Hunter Biden story. Um, this is no good. Like, we can't have this running." That's really scary. What if that happened, and um, say like uh, Biden won like uh, twenty uh, no not twenty sixteen Biden did win twenty twenty, um, but let's say it would have been that like Biden like barely wins the election or something like that or I guess Biden did win the election. Um, if the if the intelligence agencies are specifically killing these stories, then I can yes. understand for conservatives why it's like well hold on now. Um, Thousand percent. Yeah, this feels a little bit goofy. Um, so for a process like this, you do want a lot of transparency, right? Because it's really important not to just have like intelligence agencies operating the dark influencing social media companies right which is an important conversation but we can't have that one right now because we're not even talking about what's happened you know right you know what i find so this is what concerns me about matt taibbi's journalism because i was there working with twitter for much of this era right like i i fucking understand how they think what their process is for changing policy um and, and none of this seems to be in what matt taibbi is reporting which makes me really draw a conclusion that he is um, drawing from a very select um, limited group of sources. The way Twitter works is this. You have people on the trust and safety team who are, I've never had a conversation with anyone on trust and safety about any political process, like team they're voting for. I've never had a conversation that seemed political in nature. It was about collecting user experiences about things like death threats, rape threats, uh, revenge porn, you know, things that are so bots, a lot of stuff on bots. Mm -hmm. And they'll go out to stakeholders on both sides, right? And they would say, please send us these reports, tell us what's going on so we can build better tools to address it. And then they would go and they'd be like, okay, this is going to come with a certain cost. Can you help us find some academics that can talk to us about this in very precise language? And because we are a data-driven company, do you have studies to prove what you're trying to talk about? Mm -hmm. We developed a really good working relationship because like that's, as an engineer, that's just how I think too, right? So this idea that the trust and safety team is out there with some like bag for Biden, of course not. But they are going to be receptive to academics sitting there going, hey, we did a study, we found these 6,000 tweets that seem to be false information. Can you please take a look at that? Of course Twitter is going to do that. That's not corrupt at all. Yeah, and then especially there's the whole, like there were so many requests made. Like I think the largest one was like some 200,000 accounts to think that the FBI had forwarded to Twitter. The Twitter took yep. no action on it. They were like, we looked at these and we don't you know, we don't think that there's anything here. And they did nothing for it. Um, but right. you wouldn't know that if you just read like the headlines of these Twitter files coming out because it looked like Twitter was basically you know, giving in to the FBI every step of the way. And yeah, right. there was no evidence of that ever. <laughs> So, but this is where I think people have a legitimate beef is, you know, trust and safety operations are very, very expensive to scale. And it is fair, I think, to say, like you ran into this yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, high level people were like targeting your Twitter account. They have the voice of trust and safety and they're, they're trying to get you banned, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do think there is unequal there is unequal way in the way these things are applied to people. But True. I think that happens not out of like malice, 
but just because they can't, it's so fucking expensive to scale, right? True, but then also I will say something that's like a very important thing to distinguish is that like, um, I think I've ran into this where people have the ear of Twitter in an annoying way that negatively impacts me, but right. if it was like the government that was doing it, that would be a yes. far more egregious thing, right? 100%. Um, yeah, it's still annoying for me, obviously, but if I found out like Trump was coming after me, right? Like I'm gonna, it's gonna be a, a, fu a fundamentally different type of conversation we're having, yeah. So, I mean, where do you, I mean, I think where this conversation is so interesting is, you know, we're really talking about our ideals as a country, right? I believe in free speech, I'm sure you do too, but we're also living in an age where a lot of America's enemies are trying to weaponize our ideals of free speech against us, you know, mm -hmm. Putin being a really good example. If you think he would allow half this shit to be said in Russia, like you're just crazy. Yeah. But uh, there is a fomenting of division. And I, I think it's reasonable for a, a country like ours to really struggle with what's the line between, you know, uh, vaccine disinformation, right? Where's the line between election denialism, like whipped up by hostile foreign powers? I, how do you kind of see that? Um, I think that uh, I, I treat it the same way that I treat guns. And I think a lot of people have, have trouble seeing this. So I like firearms. Uh, however, I will acknowledge that there is a penalty to having firearms in society. Just by yep. virtue of having it, more people are likely to die from it. Pro proliferation of guns means more criminals are going to use it. Having one in the house means you're more likely to kill yourself um, or have a child kill themselves, et cetera, et cetera. That's a trade-off that I accept as part of that right to own a firearm. I feel like people sometimes want freedom of speech but they don't realize that there comes a cost with that right. And yes. I think that something that is happening is we need to understand that if we're gonna have freedom of speech, not only are we gonna have the freedom of speech, we need to be able to share it with people that we have vehement disagreement with. And I think right now people think that like, okay, well I have freedom of speech, that means I've got, free that means that I have the right to say that we should have 25 an hour minimum wage, and that guy over there has the right to say that we should only have 15 an hour minimum wage. Like that's somebody's idea of freedom of speech. But what it really means is Nazis can march down the street and you can advocate for trans children having access to hormones. That's what it really means. And what, but what it means is those two groups of people who are about as, as opposed as any two groups of people in fucking in world history have to be able to live and share like the same government. Um, and right now that is like unfathomable to most people. Progressives can't handle it. Um, conservatives are trying to fucking ban books out of libraries and schools. Uh, it seems like nobody has that principal position of freedom of speech. It's more just like uh, I want to be able to say what I want to say and maybe people like one bubble away from me can also say things and then past that it needs to be banned, shut down or murdered basically. Is what yeah. it feels like. You know, there are a lot of people in your community that are like very, um, I think, skeptical of my trying to engage with you more positively here. And it really is because of that exact principle. Something I've been extremely dismayed with the left is, you know, during Gamergate, I do believe in anti harassment policy. I believe there is a stronger role to play in enforcement. I think they should be spending money on this stuff. Um, you know, I think that when you're prosecuting death threats, that shouldn't just be to police officers. But for whatever reason, there's been a change or an acceleration of the culture on the left where death rape threats are fine if it's targets we don't like. Yeah. You found that out yourself last week. It's with that, it's that quote that I think I've heard yeah. Bosch even say it. There are no bad tactics, only bad targets. And it's like, 100%. Oof. <laughs> I've said that a thousand times. Yeah. And I don't. I, I, I'm truly wrestling. I, I really mean this, dude. I am wrestling with the progressive movement because I do believe in things like, obviously, trans rights. You know, I believe universal health care is the most cost-effective way to move forward. I do think we need, like, uh, to address wealth inequality in our country. There are policies that I believe in. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at the culture of the progressive movement, which more and more just does not seem intellectually honest with to me, right? It's doing things that I find really morally repugnant, and I, I don't know how to square that circle. Yeah, and that was always a difficult thing for me. Like, the easiest way, the easiest thing for me to get involved in, like, online debate shit in 2016 was what I was thinking is, one, I have a really aggressive internet background, so I'm used to being a bully. And two, liberals are just right on most things. Like, no offense, but like conservatives didn't believe in climate change. They thought that gay people shouldn't be allowed to get married. A lot of them like were still like fucking evangelical Christians who believe like in fucking 6,000 year old. Like conservatives just have a lot of dog shit ideas that just don't have any empirical backing on anything. They're just wrong most of the time. And I always thought that for liberals, I was like, why do you guys run from 
in these conversations so much. Like, just smash them. They're stupid. I shouldn't say they're stupid, but they're they're just so incorrect on so many things. Right. But now, when as the progressive movement has gotten more popular, and I think I think with popularity, I think comes more dogmatism. Now you've got like schools that like won't publish information if they think that it's like too bad for like the trans movement, or you've got people that are progressives that are unwilling to engage with more difficult conversations. Like I'm a I'm going to stand the vaccines. I would eat 20 million boosters if I wasn't so lazy. Like I'll defend it all day long. But there are legitimate conversations to be had about whether or not it came from a lab in Wuhan, about like, you know, myocarditis and, you know, young men in certain ages. And it's really, really, really hard to have these conversations when you're fighting against like the dogmatic progressive establishment without it trying to come down and destroy you, you know? Yeah. No, I'm fully in agreement. I mean, I grew up in a hyper Republican household. And one of the things that really, really brought me over to the Democratic side was I looked around and I realized all my Republican friends were like, really into religion and that was their they were really really certain about everything and then i talked to my democratic friends about things like tax policy and be like well this has this advantage this has this advantage it just seemed to be a more intellectually honest place to be Mm -hmm. i think the problem with the progressive movement is so much of it happens on twitter and there is a lot of trauma involved in this right and i think trauma leads to this environment where you have to use this certain language and it just it makes it really hard to wrestle with policy ideas particularly because we spend so much time insisting on this perfect reality and perfect representation of how we want to feel Mm -hmm. it makes it very hard to form like concrete alliances to move forward and get policies passed yeah especially with like this is something i've said a million times that like i think i think it's amazing that young people are radicalized because when you're young you should be radical it's age appropriate but they have way too much power and voice now on twitter like nobody should really be listening to your policy takes when you're 19 years old (laughs) nobody should really care how you feel about minimum wage when you've never worked a job before like these are conversations and it's not even so much that like you're young and fuck you it's just like like having that life experience it will change everybody you will never find a 30 year old that says you know what at 20 i really did have it all figured out i'm glad i had that here like nobody says that at 30 you know um uh one of the one of the emails i got i don't know if you followed my my whole fucking vosh manifesto arc or whatever when i, I was doing that thing yeah. uh, but in one of the parts where i solicited emails from a lot of my trans audience just to get i need to understand everything here because this is like there's so much crazy shit um one interesting email that i got from somebody was uh, there were a few like lines that like um streams of thought that were consistent through and through and one person they affirmed that and it was kind of like talking about how like radical a lot of these like trans people can be that are young on college campuses and shut up the internet blah 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 but one interesting thing they pointed out was that like these people are radical and these people are fucking cringe the reason why though is because for a lot of these people especially if they're trans they've spent like their whole life feeling really sheltered over this and getting bullied about it and having a horrible fucking experience so of course when they come onto the internet and they find communities to support them and they have the ability to like lash out at these other people that they've seen in their real life attacking them over and over again what do you expect a 20 year old to do and i was like through that frame I'm like yeah you know what that actually makes sense it reminds me of like like i did it when i was 20 and i was an atheist online everybody fucking does cringe shit like that like yeah fuck religion and blah 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 blah. so i, I kind of i empathize with it but god damn they've got so much power today that's like like yep. before i could just be like you're a college kid and you're crazy but now it's like you're a college kid and you're crazy and you just call me cost me a two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year job fuck right, like it's way right. different now you know yeah <laughs> No, I think that's exactly done on. And this is this is where I really I, I, I really find myself asking how can I be helpful for this movement, right? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, look at DGG in Wisconsin, right? Like this is clearly a movement. You have built a community that is clearly more interested in getting shit done than a lot of other online communities. Certainly more than you know the people that just want to chirp all day on Twitter. What is, I mean, as we're moving into 2024, what do you want to do? Like, what role do you want to play in helping kind of turn us away from the abyss? Because I am 100%, I feel in my bones, if we don't start having some people that are more seasoned leaders step up and go like, this is how we need to communicate, we need coalitions, we need to, you know, uh, work elections. I think if we don't have some more maturity in the movement, I really worry we're going to go to some very dark places. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the saddest thing is the idea that maybe, like, for somebody like me or other people, you just have to kind of abandon the progressive movement, which is kind of sad. I wouldn't, it seems like a shitty thing. I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, I don't think somebody like me has any acceptance there. I've made, like, too many people will say, like, off the wall statements <laughs> to, like, ever accept me in that type of thing. So I don't know if, like, there's a place for me uh, anymore. 
in the uh, in, in the progressive movement. I don't agree so with that. what? I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, I mean, you're gonna have a really hard time putting up some of my statements on like BLM and then being like, oh, here's Destiny. He's gonna like have a spread. Like that's what my Omaha campaign got destroyed over. I, um, I know they did this to you. Can I make a suggestion to you? Because I've thought about if I were in your shoes, how I would handle this. Go for so, it. So Ben Shapiro did before he was like this major figure that mm -hmm. he is today, right? He put out a really interesting statement where he went through all of his older stuff and he put it up in this blog post and he basically acknowledged it and said, here, I thought about this. This is what I meant to say here. Let me say this more skillfully. Here's my current position. Like kind of what you're trying to do with like putting your stuff on, um, is it on uh, GitHub? Yeah, like the position starts, that's not you do, yeah. Because this is the thing about democratic politicians. They fucking need, they will take your volunteers, they will take your money, they will take all the help you can give them. Mm -hmm. If you can give them this much plausible deniability about it, mm -hmm. or just acknowledge this stuff. I, I know if I were working with DGG in the future and I had a candidate call me and say, we have some concerns about this statement, I would just point them to that and I'd be like, look, this is this is what you can get. Some volunteers are going to work very hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, when we did our thing in Georgia recently, like I was very, very, very upfront with everything. Like they said, the mayor wanted to take pictures, and I was like, "You don't want to take pictures with me." <laughs> like uh, you can have some of my campaign uh, volunteer people. Like these are statements I made on the internet. Like be aware of it. They're like, "Oh, okay. Well, in that case, we'll be a little bit more careful." But like I had um, dinner with a couple of the volunteer staff or whatever. I um, mean, that seemed to go okay. Um, I the the I think the thing in Omaha was a bit unique, probably because the guy that I was dealing with wasn't necessarily a politician. He was just like right. a really well-meaning guy that was like pretty well traveled want to help his city and he was not ready I felt so bad like I had a call with him and he was crying um, because people were threatening to revoke his teaching license because oh of his associate yeah and I was like Ugh. and I could tell he was not made for that type of environment um, yeah so it, it was a bit of a it wasn't like it was like a whole democratic machine I was dealing with that cast me out it was like a guy it was a poor dude that was like a teacher from Omaha that just wanted to make his community better that was not ready for the shit storm that was coming online for him from all the people online and in Omaha that were like started to attack him over my shit so I was like eh, I got it yeah I work with Jank and we have a saying when we um, when we do stuff together we we generally don't do big missions with people that have not been through the shit before yeah, yeah <laughs> because yeah, yeah. of this exact reason like mm -hmm. once you've experienced a certain level of internet harassment you're just like yay I've got it that's fine mm -hmm. I don't feel anything anymore yeah. so we just don't form close alliances with people that haven't done that because they will break and you feel awful about mm -hmm. it and it fucks over like whatever mission you're trying to further <laughs> and damages 100%. everything. So yeah, it's hard. A hundred percent. Dude, I, I really, I think, I really hope you'll take a moment and feel some pride about the community you've built. Like, I'm not going to say DGG is perfect on everything, mm -hmm. but they are unusually willing to step up and do the real work in my experience. And that, that didn't happen serendipitously, man. That comes from the top, and yeah. you should be really proud of that. No, yeah, I am. I definitely am. I did that. I think I did, like, one shout-out for Georgia, and I got, like, 300 canvassers to show up there for That's that runoff crazy. election. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty I'm happy. Yeah. I think Does that piss dude. you off that you didn't get credit in media about that? Um, not so. The my viewpoint has always been like I'll be like a Batman figure to like fucking do whatever in the background as long as like I know what I'm doing and I'm I obviously I get paid really well so I'm not going to complain that I'm like impoverished forever. The only thing that changed my mind over the past year about building a reputation is I'll, I'll have it so that you don't give me credit for shit. That's fine, but you can't attack me on shit. If you're going to start attacking right. my shit, well then if you're going to start attacking me for every fault I have, then I'm going to want credit for every good thing I do. So that's been yeah. something I have been working a little on. It's like, no, actually I think I do need credit for some of this stuff because when you've got people like Hassan running out here saying like, oh, I built politics on Twitch, or you've got other people saying like, oh, Destiny, all he's ever done is like be racist just online it's like okay well no we are going to we're uh, yeah so it's something i'm kind of working on a little bit more in terms of like when i go out to do these events like contacting media preemptively or whatever if anybody wants to come and cover it and stuff um but yeah i'm getting that that media apparatus is and the communication everything with media is a, is a really 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 vital skill to have that i'm still kind of working yeah. on my my little organization for yeah getting getting people that can do that well I mean, I, in my view, you know, Jank has run into this a lot too, right? This dude has raised millions of dollars for Democrats in back channel. He has gotten more volunteers to races. 
people will be running like suicide races where they have no chance of winning. He will say something and they'll end up with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in their bank account. He does so much good. Mm -hmm. And yet his reputation is like this caustic asshole online, which is understandable. He says a lot of terrible shit. And I, I think the way I think about this is the data is so clear that without millennials and Gen Z, the Democratic Party is just fucked on all of these high stakes races. Look at the preliminary data coming out of Wisconsin. We would not have won that without voters under 30. It's certainly true for the midterms. So I think what we are seeing here is this creation of a, another political block of voters that are not, they don't respond to stuff in the traditional way the Democrats reach out to them, right? Mm -hmm. Biden can get, I love Biden, but he can get up and give a State of the Union speech and it sounds like some politician bullshit bull and people are just not going to respond to that in mm -hmm. the same way. So I think that it is really important for you to get credit for this and other leaders in this space to get credit for it. So you can, A, the Democrats will take your voting block seriously and you can recruit more people for us to win elections. I, I think that's actually very important. Yeah, it actually reminds me a little bit of the um, the problem that the FBI is running into right now, where I don't know if they've yeah. alleviated this or not. The FBI has a really big problem recruiting people to work in cybersecurity because of federal restrictions on fucking marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> they can't find yeah. fucking hackers. They can't find programmers because they all fucking smoke weed. Um, I, I want to say I heard something recently about them trying to get laxing up on that a little bit, but it's really hard for federal standards because they're federally illegal. And um, yeah, it feels the same with like the Democratic Party like we're purity testing the fuck out of everybody so much like you're not going to have any like inspiring leaders left like you're just going to get the boring politicians and yeah. Um, yeah and then it doesn't hurt that like or it doesn't help that like some of your progressive leadership like AOC who I was initially hypercritical of who I think has like come along really well as a developing oh, politician um, yeah. yeah but now she's been like completely I don't want to say completely abandoned but damn everybody that used to support her online and at least that I've seen progressively fucking hates her now because they, th they think she's a sellout oh she's with Pelosi now oh she didn't uh, do force the vote like oh but you know she's a totally ineffective blah 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 because she didn't like single-handedly usher in communism from her one position as a representative you know it's like jesus christ but this is this is the problem with the progressive movement overall i mean it's happened to me to some extent it certainly happened to you it's happened with jank who fucking invented online progressive news right it's happened to every single trans public figure i can think of certainly contra points right um, <laughs> like every other day to, for her yeah right it, it's like it's this pattern again and again and again where you have leaders that are built up and then i think progressives are particularly skilled at tearing them down and yeah, this is. I, I really. And then on the a, on yeah. the flip side of that, you have to fight against conservatives, and right. it's like, bro, Roy Moore wanted to fuck fifteen year olds, and they still like champion this dude. It's like, holy shit, how do I get that type of support? What the fuck? Like, yeah, Jesus, like they'll they'll support fucking anybody if they get the okay from Republican leadership for it. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Jesus. No, no, no. This is what I was gonna say, and this is why you know I did have a change of heart on you. I mean, initially. Look, dude, I'm just going to be honest. I, when I first saw your stuff, it was that second debate you had with Sam Cedar. Oh, and, geez. The cum guzzling one? The cum <laughs> guzzling buckets of cum. Yeah, one. nice. I'll tell you sometime about trying to explain this to Jenk, by the way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and then, um, you know, the Caffles Manifesto and people started sending me your greatest hits on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. You look like an asshole. Yeah, I, of I'm course, sorry, yeah. but you, you did. You don't and have to apologize for it. But there, people do the same thing to me, right? And then I start actually watching your show and I'm like, oh, there's actually a lot of shared values here on this, right? Like, this is someone who is doing good work in the aggregate, right? And, you know, I really tried to. We didn't get off to a good start, but I see how we can do good work together, particularly getting people activated for elections. So right. I, I just I think that's really important to model for people, like putting small differences aside and trying to get done what you can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree for sure. Yeah. Well, that's it, man. Just wanted to stop by, give you uh, props for Georgia. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Have fun. Be careful. Yep. Stay safe. Yeah. Talk soon. Bye. Don't trust that person, okay? They're gonna backstep us, I can feel it. Getting this kind of off topic, but when they were doing the, um, apparently when they were doing the discovery through the uh, Twitter files and they were looking at like all the messages, like there's a bunch of mundane stuff that they were sending to each other. Mm -hmm. They were learning about all the different things that people were saying to each other on Twitter. How mm -hmm. did you feel about the fact that um, 
there was a lot of government involvement in some of the decision making process or pressure from the government to cover certain stories. I know you had issues with the way the reporters handle some things or maybe some things that weren't true, but did you feel like there was anything in the Twitter files content that was actually poignant in regards to government involvement in social media? Yeah, so like I'm always gonna recommend people read them themselves. Like I was <laughs> shocked in going through it that I actually thought Twitter went above and beyond what I would have expected for them to be as good faith as possible. Like the way that the Twitter files are presented is that like basically the FBI DM them and they were like ban this conservative, this conservative, this conservative, do that shit and like get rid of them because we don't like them. But like if you actually read through the emails on the Twitter files, like there is constant like heated debate over how they're supposed to handle certain requests. Um, a lot of them they just flat out reject. They're like the FBI is out of their mind. We don't think they have evidence for this. We don't agree with that. That like it seems yeah. like yeah they tried really hard um, to to remain as as you know like honest to their TOS and everything as possible. Um, so it, with that in mind, you know, some people will ask like the broader question of like, should the FBI have anything to say about this at all? Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, like the issue is people forget. I understand we're very recent, but like there was some really weird shit with Russia, like starting fake companies and bot accounts and shit to like influence elections over the 2016 cycle. I think it's OK that like um, now the social medias have more interaction with the government in terms of them saying like, hey, you know, you should check out these accounts. This might be good. This might be bad. Keep that in mind. Um, as long as that there's like transparency there with that, I think that that's fine fine um yeah as long yeah. as there's transparency yeah but maybe i don't know I, I guess when you're talking about the whole bots and stuff like that and influencing the election that's fine mm -hmm. i don't know i guess maybe i just never thought of a reason why why they should be doing that but i guess yeah well i think the issue is that like Nobody wants there to be, nobody wants to be the site that had like 17,000 like Russian accounts like doing, like there were huge Twitter accounts in the United States that people didn't know were ran by Russians. Like there was an account called 10 GOP and I think everybody thought it was just like the um, the conservatives in Tennessee were running that account. It was like the conservative party official account. I think it might have even been verified and that had over 200,000 followers and it was just Russians. <laughs> we're just running the account. Um, yeah, that shit's kind of wild. So, you know, if the if social media companies are like, you know what, if the FBI wants to point us in the right direction or give us like a, you know, a hand here and figuring out which of these accounts are good or not, I think that's, I don't think that's a bad thing. Hmm. What was it? What about with the Hunter Biden story? I heard there was a lot of back and forth of whether or not they're going to do something about that. The I Hunter Biden one. Really so that was a decision that Twitter made. There was no direct request from the government ever to censor that. Despite some conservatives saying that, ask them where that request is. And they'll never be able to point it out because that's not true. But the um, that was legitimately a very confusing and challenging story for Twitter to deal with. Um, I think in the end, they admitted that they didn't like their response. Um, I think they uncensored it. Was it like three days? Uh, it might have been two days where they lifted the warning on it. Um, but you've got to admit, and nobody likes to admit this, like I am sympathetic towards their view that it did look like a fake story, right? Like the story was that like a blind dude had a laptop dropped off years ago by Hunter Biden in a laptop repair shop and it had like pictures of his dick and everything. That's like, that sounds like the fakest story in the world, right? <laughs> Um, really? Yeah, I think it does. That sounds insanely fucking fake. Um, so I'm sympathetic for some thinking like, fuck, like, is this like, a like, are these hack materials? Is this like a real thing? Like, like I'm sympathetic towards I'm trying to figure that out. Okay, so you're actually convinced that there was no FBI collusion involved with Twitter when it came to the Hunter Biden story? There's Not improperly, no, no improperly, no. And multiple people have gone on record. Wait, what do you mean improperly? What is that, what's the difference between properly and properly? Well, like, so, like, the FBI said, you guys need to be aware that there might be, like, misinformation campaigns or whatever from Russia. Like, be aware of that. Um, they, made, they made that statement, but there was never them saying, like, you need to censor the Hunter Biden story. You need to watch out for the Hunter Biden story. Like, this laptop story is fake. That had never been a uh, statement made by the FBI ever at any point. Okay, hold on. I'm looking at um, a deposition right now that they did here. Uh -huh. Okay, so they can't find any direct one. They just said they saw the former deputy chief of staff and the former general counsel showing up at Twitter at right at the critical period. Okay, so that's not the same thing. I've seen a direct. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot of people try to do a lot of conjecture there, but there's no direct evidence of it. And e e Elon, Elon Roth? Fuck, what the fuck was that guy's name? Um... Like, like this guy's like under oath like three different times saying that there was no direct request ever made and there's never been any proof ever. And like all the emails were open to Eli Roth, sorry. Um, no, like they had all the emails, they could see everything and that just never existed. Now other people are saying things like, oh, well, of course they wouldn't have made that request directly to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, but yeah. Mm. 
What about uh, their? Um, what about the fact that they banned Trump? Do you think that was justified at the time? Because I feel like the, when they, from the private communications that they saw, mm -hmm. they felt like he didn't break TOS based off what he'd done, uh, and then they had a lot of internal dialogue about it, and then they changed their mind. I really hate that Trump got banned from Twitter because it's just like, damn, a U.S. president getting banned from Twitter. That's wild but like in the context of january 6th and everything like holy f like if you were ever gonna ban a president from twitter probably would have been over some shit like that right but as i understand it it wasn't against tos in that regards and so there was a lot of discussion in regards was to it not people. i'm pretty sure that's what they said in the files that i read up on did they ever also, say to be clear, i only took like a light interest in this stuff i didn't go deep down like crazy so this is not mm -hmm. something i'm strong it was just i just thought it was mildly interesting but mm -hmm. Let me see. Yeah, they had a big debate about it. Let me see here. Let's see. I didn't actually read the Trump files, or the Twitter files related to Trump, actually, so. It's possible they did have that, and I just totally didn't catch it. It's actually interesting. Uh, okay, well, they're quoting verbatim, so you can take a look at it. Are you linking me? Yeah, I, I think I did I send you something. Oh, no, I sent it to the wrong stuff. Nice. Send it to my D&D campaign. They're all like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Here you go. Just uh, scroll down. Like, they have all the direct quotes and images, screenshots. Let's see. Maybe because I am from China, I deeply understand how censorship can destroy the public conversation. I understand the sphere, but I also think it's important to understand that censorship by a government is very different than censorship of the government. The first man in the United States, and similar legislation, other countries, similar concepts exist specifically to prevent the government from silencing the people. I respect that, but realistically, we impose far stricter rules on effectively everyone else on the platform. Um, we started labeling slash restricting his tweets when they became a threat to democracy and seemed like that was our red line yesterday. He clearly attempted to overthrow a democratic system of government and showed no sense of remorse. That is not a clear reason to suspend him. Again, as an unhinged ruler, attempting to subvert the most powerful democracy in the world. I'm not sure what that would be. Shrug. If you look at some of the stuff, you have in, uh, they have a lot of the people on the inside being like, yeah, it's clear what he's saying is maybe wrong, but it's not a violation of the rules. And you have Vijay, Vijay Gade. Mm -hmm. God damn, I mean, <laughs> sorry. The biggest question is whether the tweet like this one uh, from this morning from Trump, which isn't a rule violation on its face, is being used as coded incitement for further violence. Mm -hmm. I think they had like a very, very intense debate about it. Another yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure that there's probably like a big debate inside. But like, but I, the thing that I'm, I guess, I'm trying to get at is like, you think there is like legitimate room for disagreement there, right? Do you think, or do you think it's like all just political partisanship? Because when I'm reading this, this reads like the rest of the Twitter files, where like there seems to be legitimately a ton of discussion inside Twitter, where they're kind of like they don't know 100 percent what they should do, so they're having like big conversations between themselves to figure it out, which I think is healthy. I think that's good. Um, it's not just like one guy is dictating like we're gonna ban Trump today. Like there is a lot of like debate even inside of like, well, does this violate the rules? Does it not? Or is it kind of, it's kind of yeah. excitement about it? Yeah. Which is a good thing. I think it's good that they're having these kinds of debates. So it's mm -hmm. very reassuring that they're not all just on the same page, like get this guy out of here. We yeah. gotta go. Like it's good that they have people that are disagreeing. Um, another person wrote, according to Weiss, that the scaled enforcement team came to view Trump as the leader of a terrorist group responsible for violent death comparable to the Christchurch shooter. Mm -hmm. um, they open, I wonder, I, I, want, I want to see those actual messages. I don't want to hear somebody else's characterization. Yeah, sure. it's also very irritating that they wouldn't publish a lot more. Elon initially said they were going to, but then they decided not to. Um, that's a little I bit imagine more. there's probably a variety of reasons for that, but no. to put up that volume of information and personal messages, there's probably stuff in there that can be used to sue people, personal info. Like they would have to do a lot of vetting to be able to get all that stuff. Yeah, but they could do when it. When they described the volume of stuff, it sounded like it was massive. Yeah, but I'm saying they could at least publish all the email chains around some of the some of the selected messages they showed. I think they could have Fair. done it. Fair. I would have been inclined to agree with you. Do you think Trump should have been banned at the time? I mean, I kind of, I yeah, I think so. I'm, I think I'm really sympathetic towards that. Yeah, like we just after January six, that was wild. Like, imagine you don't ban him and he starts taking to Twitter and like something else happens. Like, you're gonna feel like the country might have been destroyed because of you. Like, you failed as an American to protect your democracy or something. You know? Yeah.